This is the Owens Recovery Science Podcast. Hey there, everyone, and thanks for tuning back in to another Owens Recovery Science Podcast. This is Johnny Owens. Before we get into our podcast today, which, which is going to be a really good one, um, talk about a really new impactful study. Um, I, I do want to put out uh, some really sad news. So one of our early podcasts we did with Dr. Kevin Tipton, it, it was back in 2018. It was called Stop the Muscle Dump. And Kevin, uh, if you all don't know of him, he's, he's an amazing scientist and researcher um, and you know, muscle physiologist and, and kind of knows all things protein synthesis. And, and he was a good friend of mine. We, we were together at University of Texas Medical Branch, um, soccer buddies, rugby buddies. Um, he came out of Bob Wolf's lab there, which is legendary with all these other amazing minds. And unfortunately, um, just a couple of weeks ago, we found out Kevin passed away. Um, young guy, super active, just, just shocking um, to, to all of us that knew him. And so just want to say, um, rest in peace, Kevin. It, it broke my heart when I heard this. And, and so um, if you haven't listened to that podcast, I re-listened the other day just to just kind of hear Kevin's voice. I still picked up some pearls that he dropped in there, but um, an amazing guy and, and check out that stop the muscle dump. And if anyone needs help during this trying times, find help. Um, you know, it's life's too short already. So we, we don't want to lose people. So anyways, want to get that sad stuff out of the way and then move into the fun stuff. So we'll roll into another Orange Cover Science podcast. All right, welcome back to Owens Recovery Science Podcast. First of the year, 2022. Feels like 2021, maybe better than 2020. I'm not sure. Kyle, what's up, man? Uh, everything is good out here on the West Coast. It's good. I know this is going to surprise everybody, but it's sunny and like 72. Nice, nice. Sunny 72. Still wearing your mask out there. Still, um, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, they let me take it off for the Zoom calls. But oh, good, good. Yeah, I would. You know what? It would be better if you had it on. It ah, no, see, there. I knew that was kind of <laughs> That's why I have the beard. There's only you only see half my face all the time. Yeah, that's smart. One hundred percent of the time, you see half my face. Well, you've done the flip. As you lose the hair up top, you grow it down. On yeah, the bottom, it, it, so. it migrated. Yep, it definitely it has, migrated. Man. This is how well, it goes. Good to see you, man. Our first podcast of 2022. So I'm super stoked for this one because, you know, I'm kind of tired. We always have these guys that are like way smarter than us on the podcast, and yeah. like way more accomplished than us on the yeah. podcast. I'm going through their bios and like his 10 page CV, like, Jesus, how am I going to cram all this in? But, <laughs> but anyways, um, we, we, we have a, a great, great one today because it's, it's a cool paper. It won an, uh, an award we'll talk about. Um, they're doing really cool stuff up there. And so uh, we have Dr. Edward Chang on today, who's, who's from Anova Healthcare um, up in DC. So our, if you listen to our podcast, you know, we've had Seth Lee on before. We've, we've done stuff and talked about our work with Robin West. And so Anova is near and dear to our heart and, and we love what they're doing up there. He's been at Anova since 2015. Um, he's an orthopedic surgeon. He's also the director of, of research up there. Uh, associate professor at, at UVA now, right, Ed? Not, yeah, that's UBC. right. Yeah. I saw that last minute. So UVA, also adjunct uh, professor at, at Ushus, um, who I, I used to work a lot with at the military's medical side up there, Walter Reed. And he, he's checked all the boxes, you know, um, went to Johns Hopkins for undergrad, did medical school at, at Robert Wood Johnson, and then did the illustrious Rothman Institute for Fellowship. And then the illustrious UPMC Pittsburgh for, um, for, for a residency at Rothman and fellowship at UPMC Pittsburgh. So that meant you were chasing Jim Bradley up and down the sidelines at, at Steelers games. I don't envy that. I mean, that's, that's all you do. You just got to, <laughs> Bradley goes a million miles a minute. You just got to keep up with him. Not many people intimidate me, except when Bradley walks in and wants to talk to me. And, and then I start shaking in my boots. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, I remember the first time I met him, he just, he's a big guy and just, he's yeah. just like, Chang, get over here. And it, you know, it was like the first thing in the OR, I barely knew what I was doing. And, uh, but yeah, he, he's one of my, uh, you know, uh, big mentors and, you know, he's really helped me along my career. Yeah. He called me last year and he was basically like, Hey, Johnny, Jim Bradley here. I'm on today's show tomorrow. I need everything you can do to update me on BFR. Okay. Uh, <laughs> give you that to me about 30 minutes. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> so, <laughs> everything he does that. He's hard. Cool. <laughs> He's not a big texter. He just calls. And, yeah, um, yeah. and I feel like anytime he calls, I have to pick up right away, no matter what I was doing. <laughs> yeah. You, you answer that call. Yeah. Cool. And, and awards too. So uh, top clinical educator at, 
at uh, VCU when, when you were there. And then also top doctor in DC. Nice. Congrats, man. In 2019. And then um, what we're going to talk about today um, is, is a paper that you've done, a, a study on blood flow restriction, which is going to be impactful. It's really cool. Um, early use of blood flow restriction training with low intensity exercise following ACL um, improves quad strength and post-operative pain and, and RCT. And, and you presented this, um, your initial work on this at AOSSM. You won the O'Donoghue Award, which is basically the, the best overall paper for a clinical trial or, or human trial. Um, so congrats on that. And, and I'm just going to throw out there, I, I think we're dominating AOSSM with BFR right now. So Eric Bowman and, they, and the KJ guys, they won the CISC Award for their BFR trial on, on Proximal. And then um, Andy Sheehan, kind of a kickoff for our, our bigger ACL grant we got. He won the, um, the AOSSM Sandy Kirkland grant for his paper um, on BFR and ACL. So they should just call it the AOSSM slash BFR conference now. <laughs> Well, and what was the Methodist crew? They got something too, or they got the big media release. Um, oh, they got the MLB award. Years ago. Oh, I don't know that one, but they just won the MLB award for their shoulder paper. Brad Lambert's group did. Oh, cool. I don't even know what that award is. So cool. Ed, Ed, Dr. Shane, thanks for being on, man. Oh, uh, th thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Cool. So give us your background. So um, where you're from, you know, how you decided to become an orthopedic surgeon and, and kind of what your practice is like up there at Nova. Yeah. So I grew up in uh, Northern Jersey, just outside New York. So a big, you know, Mets, Jets, New York Knicks fan growing up my whole life, played sports as well. And, you know, I had a lot of injuries growing up and I was always interested in sports medicine, but it really wasn't until I got to medical school, I was really thinking about just becoming a cardiologist. And um, I, one day, my first rotation was in orthopedics uh, and in general surgery. And then my uh, elective was orthopedics. And I did not realize that you could just have a career taking care of athletes and sports medicine, doing all the procedures that I kind of read about, you know, growing up. And so that was kind of my, you know, how, how it led me into going into orthopedics. Um, and really, I, it's probably the best decision I ever made because I honestly couldn't imagine myself being a cardiologist. <laughs> I, I'd like to jump in here and say, I, I know straight away that Dr. Chang is a better human being than me because in the off air, he learned what a big Houston Astros fan I was. And he just dropped in there that he's a Mets fan and he did not bring up 1986. So I'd like to thank you, Dr. Chang, for not rubbing it in because pretty much all my Mets and I, I definitely would have rubbed it in. If I had been a Mets fan and you were the shoe on the other foot, I'd be like, ah, how do you like 1986? Dr. Chang. Well, you know? <laughs> actually, Kyle, when you were talking about the Astros, I just yeah. finished the once upon a time in Queens documentary on ESPN. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And they, you know, I was only a few years old when, you know, when 86 happened and I just got yeah. to rewatch that um that yeah. series and it yeah i actually something. wanted to bring it up but i didn't say yeah i know that's what i say you're better than me because i definitely 100 percent would have brought it up <laughs> <laughs> well now i'm pissed that you were just a few years old when that game happened oh I was, well no <laughs> I was doing school, that alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i should have mentioned you're just that. all mad now <laughs> <laughs> well i i grew up in west texas in the podunks and i'm actually a mets fan because the only baseball we could get what was the... uh, we we got we got w o r on cable you know the the new york channel so yeah. the only baseball what? i could really i couldn't even get ranger stuff so really? i grew up yeah strawberry you know i had a curly kind Grief. of um, i look like gary carter my hair so i, I was proud to rock that <laughs> gary carter fro back in the day so okay. he was my favorite gary carter ray knight Keith Garden. Hernandez, yeah. all those guys, man. Those yeah. are some ball games back then. Yeah. So much fun. Can I, I don't know if I, a little baseball lore here. I think that was the same. I think this was the same year. Um, do y'all remember Billy Hatcher breaking a bat and the bat was corked? Do you remember that? I don't remember that one. I no. probably shouldn't tell you on air, but I know who corked the bat. Let me just. I'll, I'll tell you that. I'm not going to tell you actually who did it, but I know the person that did cork the bat. Well, you can't tease it. Go ahead and drop it, man. I mean, I can't do it. No, I mean, you know, oh, we, 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 yeah. it may or may not have been a family member of mine. Oh, geez. That's what I'm about to say. Someone in your family. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and I learned us. that very late in life. So it was kind of funny. Yeah. Well, one day you'll have to let us know. 
one of these days off air. Dr. Chang, tell us a little bit about your practice. So what are you kind of just one certain region or is there stuff you like to focus on? Yeah. So um, like you said earlier, I'm, I'm at a Nova healthcare system in Northern Virginia. So we're just a few miles outside of DC. Actually, I'm in DC right now. And um, in our orthopedic group, you know, in the sports medicine division, it's great. We have six orthopedic sports surgeons, um, three primary care sports physicians, as well as uh, neuropsychologists that take care of concussion. Um, and you mentioned Seth Bleas, he's also the director of our rehab services. So in every office, we have our PT clinic right there. And, you know, it's great that we get to communicate with our therapist. Um, me personally, in my practice, I really take care of shoulder, elbow, knee, sports medicine uh, surgery. So um, the typical stuff, you know, rotator cuff, labrums in the shoulder, and then uh, ligament, cartilage, meniscus in the knee, and then uh, elbow arthroscopy and some medial elbow and throwing athletes too. Nice. Yeah, if, if anyone's up in there and they – they need to see a surgeon, definitely see one of you guys, but also your facility is just super cool. Um, it's, you've, you've set it up. It's badass. You got rehab right there and it's just massive, cool facility. And last time I was there, y'all were just building that outdoor kind of turf filled area and, and all of that. So it's pretty, yeah, that, that's, um, that's completed now. So it's, um, it's all up and running and, you know, our patients love it, especially our kids, you know, they sick of rehabbing. They got a you know, eight, nine month rehab in ACL get them outside and do some stuff on that turf field. It, it just does wonders for them. They're just like so much happier you know, when they come back and see me once they're out there. Yeah, it's nice. Nice. So we're going to roll into this study here in a minute. Yeah. How did you kind of come up with doing a, a rehab slash blood flow restriction study? Were you already doing some BFR stuff or? Yeah. Um, so since 2016, 2017, we've had BFR in our clinics and uh, our patients yeah, and I feel like we were one of the first earlier adopters in our area, um, and and especially amongst my friends, you know, who are all orthopedic surgeons throughout the country. And you guys were, you know, I, a lot of my patients were coming back saying, "Oh yeah, you know, uh, this therapist, you know, tried something, you know, be a blood flow restriction. They just put a, you know, blood pressure cuff on my leg, and, and man, it was hard, but I felt great afterwards, and I feel like I I was progressing with strength because the biggest issue I have is trying to prevent muscle atrophy in my post-op patients. And, um, and I, and because our, all our PT clinics had BFR, it made a study like the one I designed, um, pretty easy to do. And so, um, and then as I was, um, thinking about it, one of the, um, I talked to Seth about this and we decided, Hey, why don't we just see, you know, we, we talk about all the time that we think BFR and early post-operative, you know, uh, ACLs would be beneficial in terms of muscle strength. Why don't we just actually take a look at it? And so uh, we designed this randomized controlled trial um, and we started it probably at the end of 2018. Um, and it's, we just completed it now. So the, you know, the numbers that I had that I presented at AOSSM is about double that. So uh, we're just kind of rewriting the paper right now to submit it. It'll have a, you know, it's a little bit more powered uh, uh, study. Nice, nice. So I'm excited to see with the new power on it. Yeah. And cool. Yeah, you guys. So 2015 is when we really started ramping up, kind of publicly training a bit. And Seth was one of the first ones. 2016. So you guys like that first year really started implementing. So you were an early adopter, not just up in DC, but but nationwide. At least for people who do it through us. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. I'd like. So one thing on your title, I'm going to get to, and, and it was great reading your paper that you put out there is early use of blood flow restriction. Yeah. And so I, I, I think that's key. And, and so there's a, there's a paper you mentioned in there. And, and I, I was initially, I was kind of involved when they were set up design at Ashish Betty's where they, they yeah. did it a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they used the worst title ever. Blood flow restriction like doesn't work. <laughs> yes. yeah. You know, yeah. I, I, that paper came yeah. out in the middle of our clinical trial. And, you know, I saw that at my uh, resident, one of my residents, Andy Curley, um, he, yeah. You text me. It's like, hey, did you see this paper by uh, Dr. Betty? And I looked at it, and it, you know, you look at exactly when, you know, they were using it. It was at the point where the patients were already doing high loads, and yeah. you know, that's where you know most of the papers suggest that BFR, you know, is not as uh, applicable. It's more in that early post-op periods when we should be using. It. And I said, this is perfect because our, you know, our paper is going to be the exact opposite of that. Uh, and because we were already starting to see like the differences uh, between the uh, subject and control groups. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, I yeah, think the thing that gets lost in that paper too, is their, their heavy load group didn't get stronger either. 
Yeah. You know, like none of essentially their rehab program that they designed for that child didn't do much of anything in the time frame that they studied anyway. So um, it's an, it's an important piece that kind of gets lost, especially with the I well, mean, you, you see like, the clickbait title that they had. Right. Yeah. I mean, that and that's the, the journals want your conclusion. That's why my title is so like you just read that title took like a minute on my paper. Yeah. And that's because the yeah. you know, AGSM and some of those journals, they they want that kind of, you know, mm-hmm. they want that conclusion right there in the title. You know, that's not that wasn't our initial title for this paper. Interesting. Um, yeah. um, so, yeah. And actually, I, I talked to um, Dr. Betty. Uh, at AOSSM back in July, and you know he was one of the ones that were selecting the O'Donohue Awards, and you know he cool. said you know that's exact you know one of the big um, advantages of our paper was that we were doing it you know in that early stage, try to really kind of um, go right at you know preventing muscle atrophy from you know week one or two. Yeah, and Ashish is a friend, and he he's a big BFR guy as well. So yeah. it's not like he, they they don't do it there at, in Detroit and at Michigan. But mm-hmm. you know, and, and in their defense, and when Rian was was setting it up, they were already seeing that is at twelve weeks when they were still pushing people heavy, the needle wasn't really moving. So that you know, their point was maybe we'll throw this this tourniquet on, and it'll give us a little bit of something sure. extra. And so when you know, because at first we were like, yeah. Not sure about this. Probably not going to go anywhere. But it's like, well, I mean, we're not going to know until we know. And so, you know, we always put out there: BFR is a low load game. You know, it's it's not made for heavy load. If you're lifting heavy, you're already putting a lot of occlusion on the vessels already. Tourniquet's not going to give you that much difference. And then again, like you said, doing it 12 weeks out is 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 the problem. So perfect on your on yours for starting early, and perfect on yours for starting low load. So you want to kind of go into a little bit of the design and what you guys, your hypothesis was? Yeah, sure. So our hypothesis was that uh, early use of BFR would be, uh, will help uh, basically slow down muscle atrophy, improve quadriceps strength. Um, That was our, that's what we were basically looking at. That was our primary hypothesis. Uh, We want to conduct a randomized control trial. So basically patients that underwent ACL reconstruction um, were, and that want to participate, excuse me, in the study were either randomized to get um, early use of BFR along with the standard rehab program or get randomized to just, just a standard rehab program uh, itself. Um, and so we had about uh, 35 patients, but 26 are available for follow-up. Um, and what we kind of found and, and was that patients that, had, um, that were using the BFR had uh, statistically significant increase in quadriceps strength uh, as measured by terminal knee extension. Um, and what was really interesting was that their pain, their VAS scores um, at six weeks was significantly lower than the patients that did not get BFR. And that was something that I heard a little bit about, but you know, it was really surprising uh, to see that, uh, the, the, the difference in that. Yeah, that's something, I mean, if you listen to our podcast, people probably get sick of us because we're so hot on this pain thing with it right now. Uh, but you know, one, of, one of the guys that we work closely with over, over in Europe, Luke Hughes and Stephen Patterson, they're, they're really going deep into looking at why are people getting this analgesic benefit? You know, they did a uh, NHS trial over there, an ACL study, and, and same thing. They saw reduced pain in their ACL patients as well compared to, the, to a, an actually a heavy load group. And, and even they're, they're starting to see some mechanisms here that there's an increase in, in endogenous opioid production in the, in the BFR group. So that could be why, especially we see an acute response, but you know, it might be this kind of more chronic six week kind of change as well. A low load, but you're getting some quad strength back. Maybe they're not having as much pain, just gimping around the house and stuff like that. Right. Uh, I mean, we know that weak quads leads to patellofemoral pain and that you know, early on after ACL, you're already kind of limping around from your surgery. Uh, if your quads are weak too, that puts a lot more stress across that patellofemoral joint. And you know, I just think that's a huge deal. Now, when you look at our data at three months, they kind of normalized because, you know, at three months, most patients are doing pretty well from a pain perspective after an ACL reconstruction. But I mean, I think it's a huge deal that, you know, at six weeks that, you know, they're not in a lot of pain. They can, you know, they can be mentally happier. They can work harder on physical therapy. And, and so, you know, I, I found, I probably found that to be the most significant finding in our study because there have been other studies showing you know, the, the benefits of BFR in terms of, you know, preventing muscle atrophy and 
and uh, and also promoting strength and hypertrophy already. So this is just a really cool finding. Yeah, it's a little extra carrot on top of it there. That's for yeah. sure. And so they normalized in their VAS scores at 12 weeks, but strength was still higher for the BFR group, right? Yes. So you yeah, still so saw that your second go around here. Yeah. So um, as when we go all the way out to three months out, yeah, strength was higher. Uh, basically from week six or eight on, it was, it was always higher uh, at that point. Nice. So uh, that was, you know, that was, you know, that was our hypothesis. We kind of expected it. So it was nice to see that, you know, um, that was validated. Yeah. That's always, it's always nice to see. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, you know, Kyle put this question when we were first kind of going back and forth, how do you measure terminal knee extension? And so the way you did it actually was pretty slick. I, I've never seen using the dynamometer yeah, yeah, yeah. in that way. Yeah. So I don't know if you want to elaborate or yeah. we can as well. We read into it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. We, we basically placed a dynamometer uh, behind, behind the leg uh, on a kind of hard flat surface. And we don't, uh, we didn't have access, you know, to um, some of the fancy machines. So we had to, this is what, yeah, about X, excuse me. Yeah. And so um, this is what we use to kind of measure. And it, there's a multiple studies that have been published showing that this is a good alternative to use the Bodex to uh, measure, you know, different types of strengths. So um, that's what we use. We were able to purchase those kind of across the different PT centers yeah. um, where we train, you know, one therapist to be the one measuring uh, the patients. And that terminal knee extension is, you know, almost more important, uh, especially yeah. that first 12 weeks with these ACLs. That's what's really cool because, you know, probably the most valid way to use a Biodex now is, is to do an isometric with it. You know, it's 60 right. to 90, yeah. but then you're like, you're measuring maybe some strength that way, but uh, how many patients are at 90 degrees knee flexion? You're worried about their strength, but that zero to 30 is so important yeah. in this group. Sure. And also the, you know, measuring those patients early on using about as I'm worried about placing stress across the patellofemoral joint um, yeah. that early on too. Yeah. Yeah. No, this gets around it. It's cool. So we're, I'm going to talk to Andy we might need to add this into our ACL trial down here. <laughs> uh, I like it. We do have a biodex, but, and, and we'll be doing more of an isometric and more long-term, but it was very cool. Okay. Talking about when you guys started kind of randomizing and enrolling so it looked like in, in what i read in your paper once you saw their incisions were cleared maybe at, at the follow-up with you or maybe the pt saw that was that was that kind of your criteria that you felt pretty comfortable to start it yeah we didn't we went through a lot of the papers and there wasn't any clear consensus on when to Not start bfr and <laughs> yeah. and then and nope. that we may never know but you know there's some that say we can start within two days and some that wait you know two to three weeks um, and so again, I talked to Seth and some of the other people about that. And, uh, most of our patients are starting rehab, you know, within the first three to five days, that first one's just an eval. So usually, you know, between that second visit, usually, you know, seven to 10 to 14 days is when they're initiating, um, BFR, as long as their decisions looked okay. And even then I, you know, I'll get a, you know, somebody will send me a picture and see if it's okay to use, you know, like you know, maybe just a bloody stereo strip, but, um, go ahead and use it. Yeah, that's kind of, and again, your, your great use of the term early, you know, that's, that's starting early in, in most, most eyes. And, you know, we get that question so much. When's it, when's it safe to start blood flow restriction? And so if you ask me who's been doing it forever and been around surgeons who are used to it, you know, it's like, I don't know, day after surgery, I'm pretty yeah. comfortable with it. You know, what a, a buddy of mine, ProVenture, so just did a surgery on my friend who's an orthopedic military surgeon big cartilage repair and he's got his own unit and you know he's basically starting it already a couple of days post you know the, this this big macy procedure and he's comfortable with it but you know you've got to get comfortable with it and there's some things to worry about and, and there was an you know noise put out an arthroscopy i i, I don't remember Kyle, i think you said we started it six they, weeks no, noise noise paper they said three well he weeks. put that he's like we're gonna institute yeah. this with everyone at, i can't remember beginning at three weeks post op three weeks everyone three, three weeks. weeks yeah yeah okay which isn't bad we're like cool okay but then laprade put an editorial and he's like awesome. yeah well you know we start ours like within the first mm -hmm. couple of days afterwards yeah. it's almost like well yeah well we're cooler than you we started early, so <laughs> I, I, I you know i think as we get more and more kind of safety data and we feel comfortable with it yeah you know the, the number one thing we always say is you know it's, it's is the patient on board? Are you comfortable with it? Is the surgeon comfortable with it? And if they have a pissed off knee or a pissed off leg, just you're not, they're not going to tolerate it. But right. you know, I, I do agree if the incisions look good and the knee seems kind of happy, it, it seems safe to go for it. Yeah. I, um, I've been telling, I've been a little bit more and more aggressive on early use of BFR now uh, on my patients. Um, 
I think the the big ligamentous reconstructions that first visit, I just don't think they're going to be able to tolerate it because their knees tolerant hot. Yeah. yeah, but if you're doing a uh, standard knee scope um, or something or a meniscus repair where you're not going um, doing too much, uh, uh, basically too much. Uh, I don't say damage, but you're not you're know, working around the tissue too much, and you could probably start that pretty early. Uh, maybe in yeah. that first eval visit, you know, try it on as long as. You got a patient that's you know motivated and willing to try it, and yeah. uh, that goes to me thinking we also now do a lot of prehab with BFR too, so nice. it's it's really nice that the patients already know what that is going into their first post op visit. Um, maybe that's something that you know they can you know if they already knew what to expect, maybe they would try it you know that first day if they're not feeling too. Uh, that, too bad. Uh, that's huge. Them already kind of having some context for us yes, for sure in a, in a prehab i mean i just we saw it in our practice um it just makes a makes a big difference um then trying to all right i'm gonna teach you how to rehab this knee we're gonna kind of work on that and then also we're gonna do this kind of wild thing where we cut off your blood flow in your limb yeah yeah you know acclimated to it's huge we, we have a, a prehab and post acl trial going on up at in toronto right now um I can't raise his name right. John Delopoulos, the, the Toronto Raptors doc. Um, they've got a, a pretty decent sized trial rolling. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, when you see both sides, because there are some prehab studies that have shown mm -hmm. some decent stuff, but they've only done it prehab. So then we don't really know what happens post. So it'll be cool to combine those together. Or maybe you guys just need to, to do the big one down there, up there at Anova. Hey, I mean, that's something uh, that's something I've thought about uh, doing is a kind of a prehab post post op type trial. Um, it just we got to kind of kind of put our heads together and figure out how to actually design the study. But I've been thinking about that yeah. for a while. Nice. Well, it sounds like you it might be challenging. I was I thought it was interesting that a couple people had kind of crossed over um, in your in your study, yeah. you know, basically because they kind of saw that this was going on sort of deal or what, what happened there. And, and, yeah. and how I does mean, that, how does that complicate doing things moving forward? <laughs> it's hard. I can't, I mean, in our, um, in our consent form and kind of description of our study, you know, the patients, if they want to opt out and, or want to, uh, want to cross over to one or the other side, you know, they can. And um, yeah. it's usually the patients not getting BFR, seeing the guy next to them, using BFR and be like, I want that. And, you know, and yeah. get over and yeah, that's happened to, it happened a couple of times and it, it still happened, you know, it still happened yeah. afterwards too. Um, yeah. I, that's a problem. That we, tough. Yeah. That happened to us. We try to do a, a six month out chronic weakness. So if you were, you know, greater than, I think it was 25% weak post-op ACL six months out, we randomize you to BFR or exercises without, mm -hmm. and we basically couldn't keep any controls. You know, because they're doing just basically nothing. And then the guy doing BFR is like, oh, my God, that was like amazing. <laughs> like, yeah, oh, yeah, I man. feel no, better. No, no, I'm shoot, doing better. Yeah. It was. That's so, yeah, we had everyone crossed over. So. You almost need a different site altogether for your non. Well, and then you run into the problem of like, you know, we're the center for the Intrepid. So we're doing BFR yeah. there, but they're at another site. And it's like, well, you know, you had this facility influence and all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. So that's that's hard to send in the controls to another place. Yeah. So. Well, I think a good point too is you didn't mention it's kind of maybe dumb to do a sham though, um, you know, because then people and I've I've reviewed more of these papers than I like to to admit, and that's always something these reviewers put in. Well, why don't you do a sham on the control group? So you know there there was this blinding. There, there's no point <laughs> to that, and so you right. kind of want to elaborate on what you guys put in there on that. Well, yeah, we in terms of a sham, I I, I think patients will know if they're really. I mean, I guess you could maybe, you know, do a less, uh, less occlusion pressure maybe to, um, to do it. But, you know, we, we kind of decided that, you know, that just a, in terms of enrolling enough patients, it was just going to be a little bit difficult to conduct three arms into that study. So um, yeah. I think that's, we just kind of decided this is the, you know, the most simple way to kind of conduct this, uh, which is we do that. Yeah. it's No, I, I'm glad you put it in your paper as well. We, we do have some sham trials. We have a, a a sham ACL trial going on at Rush right now. And basically you, you inflate it to 20 millers of mercury and they, they literally have to hold the cuff on when they get up because it's, it's just barely on there. So you're like, ooh, how was that treatment? They're like, what do you mean? This, this little clothy thing that's on my leg right now? So yeah, it makes no sense. You guys took all comers, it sounds like. So hamstring grafts, uh, BTB, 
Um, so there was no, you know, just, just one kind of graph choice on this. No, and again, this is just early on. We just wanted to get as many patients in, you know, with ACL. We, we sure. depend, you know, regardless of what graft, you know, quad weakness and atrophy is a major problem. Um, right. It would be nice if we had larger numbers and we can maybe do some subgroup analysis, to say, hey, which one's most affected? Because my feeling yeah. it would be probably the quad tendon autographs that you know, it's probably the hottest graft right yeah. now uh, in the literature. So that would be, you know, something interesting, you know, down the road is especially, I think quad ACLs. I think that's the one where, you know, um, BFR, uh, will be, it'll be really interesting to study the effect of BFR uh, on quad rehab. Yeah, for sure. And you, you also included meniscus, you had some meniscus repairs in there as well, it looked like, right? Yes. So we had um, meniscus repairs um, and or partial meniscectomies were included. Um, what we didn't include were um, patients that had a meniscus root repair where their weight bearing would be you know, really significantly altered um, or yeah. any type of cartilage work. Uh, we just took those patients out too, just to every patient, we want them to be weight bearing coming out of surgery, just to standardize a little bit more. Okay. You did something I thought was kind of cool. And I don't think I'd seen it before where you, you basically, it seemed like you were kind of trying to handicap what the joint looked like to a degree where you were quantifying the different, you know, compartments of the knee and what the joint surfaces were looking like. Yeah. Um, every, you know, basically every patient that, uh, we grade all the cartilage in all our surgeries and, yeah. It's just one thing we know if you have, you know, if you have some degenerative changes in the knee, you're probably going to have a lower IKDC score. You'll probably have a lower VAS score post-op as well. And so we kind of want to make sure that the patients that we were enrolling, there wasn't a significant difference in the degenerative changes that were found in the knee, uh, which yeah. was, and it, which was good that we didn't really see much uh, difference. Yeah. I made sure our docs, if we ever had some of those, they, I would get them to our other therapists that I wouldn't treat them. So, you know, my, my, my patients just always kicked ass. Oh, you pristine uh, joint. All right. Nice. Uh, I'll take this one. Special uh, forces guy. All right. He's mine. Cool. Uh, uh, so Johnny into, has lived, lived a spoiled PT life, Dr. Well, Chang, in, in many ways. <laughs> I, I never, I, I haven't written a note in 20 years. Oh, I, I had so, so many in, oh, military I interns. So much. Oh. I got really good at just signing my name. That was it. Wow. <laughs> I wrote 33 notes today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's we didn't get down paid different no matter chair. what, you know? So no, that's true. I would tell my interns, all you got to write is no better or mo better. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> you can just write no. And next time you come in, we'll just put a line on it. And it looks like mo. So. Uh. <laughs> Oh, gosh, <laughs> getting into your BFR parameters. So you guys use uh, obviously Delphi systems up there. You used 80% limb occlusion pressure. Um, and, and I know yeah. we, we always kind of have to put that in there. Sometimes you have to kind of fluctuate it with patients. And that's kind of, I'm sure, clinician kind of decision making how the patient's tolerating it. Um, you put that in there and kind of the standard protocol. We just always want to put this out there so people know it. 30, 15, 15, 15, whichever one who probably listen to this podcast knows. <laughs> Everyone was done at low, low 30 second rest periods. Um, so I think that's, that's pretty much right on, right? Yeah, that's right. All right. And I think another thing that was important you put out there, this was early. You basically started them when their incision looked good and you saw no adverse events and no one drop out because of BFR. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. We started it as basically as early as possible. Once the, um, usually within, you know, five to five to 10 days, they're getting BFR, um, no adverse effects, no patients dropped out as well. You know, for the most part, they, they come back and you're like, it kicked my butt, but I loved it. Right. And so yeah. that was pretty much the common theme that I got from my patients that were uh, on the BFR trial or just my patients getting BFR in general. Yeah. Well, I and mean, this is, this is important because, you know, as we're getting into this timing talk, your paper now is showing if you start it within the, you know, those, that early phase, no issues really at all. Luke Hughes and, and the, the folks over in, in the UK, their NHS trial, they started basically within those kind of same time frame, no issues. The, the Methodist Houston guys, their paper is about to come out, same thing, started early, no issues at all. So um, it's starting to look, if we cluster these together and did a meta-analysis, I don't think we're going to see anything other than, you know, even the controls are dropping out more than, than the actual BFR group is on this. So that, that's pretty cool to see want to kind of go into your protocol. So just, you know, there's gonna be a lot of rehab people listen to this first four weeks, you, you kind of started the basic 
stuff, quad set, straight leg raises, all the, the kind of stuff they're stuck doing on a mat, randomized to BFR or not, four to six weeks going into, once they had 120 degrees range and the good straight leg raise, no lag, going into more close chain, wall squat, six, eight weeks, BFR, the deeper leg press type stuff, knee extensions and a, and a kind of controlled range, deeper wall squats, eight to 12 weeks and getting more lunges and isolated hamstrings. And, and both groups did those exercises with or without BFR, right? Cool. Yeah, and this was um, uh, designed with Seth. Uh, I basically asked him, okay, what are the you know what are the good exercises that we can use BFR for? And then we just want to make sure that both groups were going to do the same thing. Cool. And so you look at thigh size as well, and, and that didn't seem to change from from what you guys saw in this, right? I, mean, I don't yeah. know if your new analysis changed at all, or if you want to tease any of that. Yeah, the, the analysis, it trended towards a higher thigh circumference, but wasn't significant as well. So it's still still the same conclusions that we have in this paper, um, which is a little bit surprising. But you know, again, um, I think the strength was, and maybe that's because of where we're, we're just using a simple tape measure to do that. And maybe yeah. there's more advanced things such as using ultrasound, or I know you had Joe Hart on last time with Springbok and you... Yeah. Um, you use some uh, a more advanced MRI tool to, you know, to quantify muscle volume. And so, um, I, I, and so I, that might be the best, I, I mean, I'm sure that's probably the best way to really, you know, uh, assess for muscle hypertrophy. Yeah. Um, well, you got Robin up there, so she can probably get you some free spring box. Yeah. She's on, on their, on their advisory board as well. Yeah, I, like, I think we're so. just going to blame Seth for not knowing how to work a tape measure. I think is what yeah. I'm going to do. I mean, I know if it had been me, I am literally the worst person with a tape measure. Like, there, I know Johnny tells me all the time there's this good intra-rater reliability of circumferential measurements, but not when it's in my hands. I'm convinced. And I'm sure <laughs> Seth is the same way. Well, he's, he doesn't know how to convert metric system, you know, over yeah, the standard. Yeah. He's like, what's centimeters? Uh, yeah, you what know, he he probably just blew it trying to do math there <laughs> as well. Uh, Cool. This yeah. So luxury. anyways, kind of rounding back here. Really cool thing to see at the end of this. We can start it early. Basically, just do your standard ACL protocol. This isn't any different than what most people are doing with or without BFR. And you saw terminal knee extension strength basically was was better from six to 12 weeks out and less pain, which if you're asking me, those are those are kind of the two big heavy hitters. I would want my first 12 weeks out of an ACL. If their thigh got bigger, that's great, but I would much rather see strength and, and pain and uh, be better there. So kind of finishing up on the paper there, any, any kind of last thoughts you want to put in there? I, I just think that, you know, there's, there's more and more literature out there on BFR and it's advantages significantly outweigh of any potential disadvantages that we don't really see in terms of adverse effects. And I, uh, for people that are you know, wondering whether or not they want to implement BFR in their clinical practice or at, in their PT gyms, uh, I just think that you really want to, you know, use BFR early on if you're taking care of post-operative patients. I mean, the from day from post-op day zero, that muscle starts to atrophy quick, um, and in uh, any way you can do to slow down that atrophy is, is going to be such a huge deal in that patient's early post-op recovery, whether it's pain-wise and function, that uh, I just think that you know, using it as soon as possible. Now, the question is, we need to maybe, like you said earlier, come you know, publish a study saying when, you know, how soon is soon? And can we do that within the first you know, three days, five days after surgery and show that there isn't any you know, potential adverse effects? So that would be probably the next important thing um, to uh, help educate any therapists or clinicians that are thinking of using early BFR. Yeah. And, and what's cool too, I, you know, I think it's starting to be undeniable that BFR is going to be when all you can do is low load the, the winner for, for the muscle, maybe even for pain. Um, it, the new thing too, is that we're getting a little bit deeper into it. So Seth Sherman out there at Stanford, they're, they're actually starting it very early and looking at BFR versus controls and, and are going to look at what's happening at the graft. And, and is there any, any changes? They got some, you know, Stanford, all the freaking money. They got this slick new yeah. kind of imaging. They're going to, they're going to be able to look at it kind of short term. And I, and I believe more long term as well um, to see what's going on. Cause yeah, that's been thrown out there. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Can you, um, will that change some of the, you know, ability for the uh, graph to vascularize a little bit quicker and 
you know, undergo ligamentization. Yeah, I'd be, uh, I would be, I'd be very interested to see something would change and I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, what, what we need first is, you know, you know, I believe it's Jimmy Andrews put out there, you know, he's not sure what hypoxia does to a graft in the, in the early weeks. Although it's very acute hypoxia, I don't think there's anything that any of us are really that worried about. But this is we almost need this done just to say, well, look, we're not we're not messing with a graft at all. And it's not like we're seeing all these people doing ACL with BFR or having just these graft failures. So it doesn't look like there's any issue. But but then if we can say it's actually speeding it up, holy hell, that's badass. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah, I mean, well, a big win. Congrats on the paper, man, and the award. I, I kind of want to segue away from that of, of other things you're using BFR on. Are you using it with any of your upper extremity stuff and it, it, maybe like a UCL or, or shoulder at all? I, I haven't used it for anything. You know, I know there's some talk about the proximal benefits of using uh -huh. BFR, but I haven't had any experience yet using it. But that's something I wouldn't mind trying to, you know, just start, just have my patients start doing it and see as long as they're okay trying it downstream uh for uh distal biceps ucl um tennis elbow as well those are ones that we try uh you know, i've been using as well i i don't you know my patients you know the, the they, they like using it i don't know if it um i don't have any good data on you know yeah. uh, whether or not it's actually beneficial but you know my patients don't mind using it but that's what i in my clinical practice downstream i i've been using it we have a a lot of folks who are using it for UCL, you know, especially MLB and stuff like that. And groups like you and HSS, et cetera, they all use it with their elbow guys. We don't have a single study going on right now looking at that. So just, just throwing a little, you know, bug out there that that's something we get a lot of questions on, you know, we're extra articular incisions and repairs, you know, we get this swelling effect with BFR. So that that's one we we've been saying, let's, let's go a little slower on those just because sure. we don't want to, hiss or cause some increased swelling but that's that's just one of those where if we could just kind of look at some strength that that would be really fascinating getting on to the lateral epi and tennis elbow that has been something we've seen some some really kind of promising results so that's that's a group because i don't know in, in rehab those are patients that you just run away from half the time yeah, everything hurts and so uh we use it a too. Ton. yeah so there's a there's, there's several trials going on and, and we keep putting in grants in the DOD for one because we've got a lot of good just kind of clinical data. So we're hoping we get a grant, but that, that's one of those that, you know, these non-operative ones that I know you guys don't like to see either, Dr. Chang, you know, the anterior knee pains and stuff like that, send those over to rehab and say, throw throw the tourniquet on. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's basically what I do. Patellothermal pain, I tell them go to PT, yeah. BFR, and let's see what happens. Nice, nice. Cool, man. Any closing thoughts you want to share with us on anything or, or how can people find you? I tried to find you because I was going to throw out that we we're going to have you on on Twitter. You're, you're not much of a social guy, man. You're I don't have a lot of, heart. yeah, my social media is not uh, very robust. I have an Instagram account, Dr. Edward Chang. I have maybe five posts and I haven't posted in months. So um, you can follow me, but it won't, it's probably not going to be the most exciting follow. Um, Twitter <laughs> is even worse. I don't think I have a single post on it. It's been on for like two years. So I don't even know. It might be impossible to find me on that thing. Um, I don't you're, you're think you're missing like much. <laughs> my, mine, uh, mine only get good like Friday night after a few bourbons. And then all yeah. of a sudden I'm, I'm trying to figure out what I actually tweeted that night before. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just worried I'm going to make a big mistake and wake up the next morning and be like, what did you just uh, post out there? Why yeah. is Dr. West calling me right now? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, uh. And then... I, I guess final thoughts uh, is that I think there I think BFR early use is is great in our postoperative lower uh, patients lower extremity especially is my, my experience um, but I think you make the case for upper extremity as well um, I encourage most I mean pretty sure most of the people that listen to this podcast are you know going to be uh, adopters and users of BFR but the ones that aren't you know, definitely consider using that in your practice from a research perspective which I think is you know something that's you know near and dear to my heart and yours too is you know we there's so much opportunity out there to study bfr in our post-operative and non-operative patients too um, um because of its low risk it's you know ease of use once you're trained and you can you can do a lot of studies safely um and uh, and uh, you know when, when you're trying to apply for clinical trials and you know getting irb across as any researchers listening out there, it's you can do it. Um, it's 
um, compared to some interventional, you know, some of the randomized control trials we're trying to do for surgery, which is a little bit tougher to get pass across. So um, lots of lots of research opportunities out there, and, and it's definitely doable. Sky's the limit. It, it just popped in my head. Last thing, those are great points. But and also, how many times a week do you know? Do you remember what you guys did? We get that question all the time. Can you do this just two times a week or three times a week or a certain amount of visits? I forgot what you guys did. We did. Um, our patients were going to PT twice a week for the most part. Perfect. Um, Perfect. And so we were trying to do two times a week. And now Lepra published it, you know, in his little arthroscopy article back in 2018. He says, if you're doing, you know, low resistance, body weight, stuff like straight leg race, you can do it almost every single day. If yeah. you are, once you start to put load on it, he recommends maybe alternating body parts. So you do quads one day, hamstring the next day, but it, it you know, again, the, the, the research data really doesn't say how many days you can or can't use them in a row. Um, I always thought, man, it wouldn't be so great if the patient just went home with their own personalized, you know, BFR machine and just do it, you know, safely. Um, it will be great. We're, uh, we're working on it. So we, we just finished a trial with total joints at University of Colorado. Thank so, um, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if these older total joints took them home, no issues at all. So um, it's, it's awesome. that might be the future is, yeah, you guys just write a script and they they take it home with them. So it's pretty cool. So And then cool. they just send Johnny out to the house and, and Johnny teaches everybody how to use it. I'm fine with that. Hey, Grandma yeah. Smith, can I, you got some cookies here? Yeah. Cool. He'll be like, like talking to the old he'll bring Ben to write the notes. Yeah, yeah. Y'all, you have to do a note? Hell no, I won't go there then. No better. Yeah. No better. No, that's, you know, all of our trials pretty much are set up at twice a week. Um, and, 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 you know, LaProd's kind of preaching what, what we what we preach. You know, if you can't do hardly anything, the more is the better. So, if you know, pro athletes, college, you know, where you can get them in all the time. Yeah, get them in every day in those early phases. Most clinics can't do that. But, you know, that's what's beautiful about your study. Cause we get all these like, you know, academic studies and it's like, well, they did twice a day, you know, and they did exactly this much load. You got to have a biodex and, you know, you're like, well, damn, I could never do that. But, you know, everyone can do straight leg raises, quad sets, lunges twice a week with their ACL patients. And, and if you showed that they, they can get that, what you found doing that, that is so replicable. That's, that's beautiful. That's why we love this, this type of study. Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, I just wanted to have a study where, you know, this is something that, that can easily be translated to clinic, you know, if they have a BFR machine. So yeah, thanks. Cool. Awesome, man. Well, thanks for coming on. I was supposed to be in DC last week for extremity war injuries and, and the damn COVID canceled it. So uh, next time I'm in DC, let's, let's, let's hang out. Oh, uh, please do. You know, we're having our annual meeting uh, at Nats Park this year in June. Uh, Robin and I are hosting it again. Nice. And so we got you know, great speakers coming in from like Rothman, uh, Dr. Delicato coming from Florida, coming in to speak and some, some guys from Stedman too. So love for you to come down. Nice. Well, I'm not going to share a, a bed with Ben Weatherford again, like your last conference. <laughs> <laughs> we, we got a one double bed instead of two doubles. So yeah. I'm not I'll, editing I'll that out. Let's stay <laughs> I think, I think you'll be able to i'm sure we'll try to find a double room for you guys Get johnny okay. his own thanks. this time yeah. thanks thanks <laughs> awesome thanks dr oh, Jake. thanks for all your great work up there yeah, and thank you and don't be a stranger brother awesome thanks for having me on all right thanks man thanks for listening to the owens recovery science podcast owens recovery science is a single source for pcs ot's atc's dc's MDs, and other medical professionals seeking certification in personalized blood flow restriction rehabilitation training. Find them online at owensrecoveryscience.com.